From the campus of Yale University, this is Business Talk with Jim Campbell, nationally syndicated across the country on the Biz Talk radio network and coming to you from our flagship stations, Yale Radio WYBC and 1490 AM WGCH Greenwich. All talk and all business, 60 minutes of radio with leading figures from the world of business along with the business of politics and sports. The rise, fall, and comeback of former governor of New Jersey resigning amid scandal, announcing he was a gay American, the fall to grace of James McGreevy, an American redemption story. Today on Business Talk with Jim Campbell, James McGreevy served as governor of the state of New Jersey from 2002 until resigning in 2004 after appointing his secret male lover as Homeland Security Advisor despite an apparent lack of qualifications for the positions. Threat of sexual harassment suits prompted the governor to resign. He was the first openly gay governor in the U.S. history. He'd go on to obtain his Master's of Divinity with the goal of becoming an Episcopal miniature. He volunteered service through Exodus Transitional Community for former prisoners seeking rehabilitation and in July of 2013 appointed head of Jersey City's Employment and Training Program. His book is The Confession and the HBO documentary on his story is Fall to Grace produced by Alexandra Pelosi. Welcome Governor, how are you? Jim, it's so good to be with you. It's our honor and and we've had uh, we've sort of developed a niche somehow on comeback shows. We had the first interview with Elliot Spitzer after he resigned. Second interview after 60 Minutes with Dennis Kozlowski in the Enron scandal. We had a woman from the Raj Rajaratan Largest Insider Trading Scandal, Paula Broadwell, Petraeus, and some of the Madoff family members that were innocent. So um, uh, the, these fall and comeback shows are kind of a specialty, and we really enjoy them, and we're honored to have you. Uh, Jim, thank you very much. You're with, very kind. With that, with that preamble, uh, I want to ask you this question because I've always wondered it. When you announced your resignation, you said, I am a gay American. Why did, you, why did you say with that phraseology, American, as opposed to just gay? Because, you know, I, I grew up in a household with a father who was a Marine Corps drill instructor. Mm-hmm. And, and part of it was understanding that, you know, we're blessed to live in this great nation with all its flaws. But still, I believe, the, the greatest nation in the world with civil liberties and, and tradition for individual opportunity. And so it's, I also wanted to recognize that not only who I am, but my Americanness, my nationality, my identification is an intrinsic part of who, who and what I am. You seem to show a lot of grace during the, the event. Um, was the inside stress um, just unbelievable? You know, it, it was tremendous. But, you know, at Jim, there was also sort of a point of reckoning and there's a point of mm-hmm. self-acceptance after all these years. And so that's also what's so powerful. I mean, the whole notion of authenticity to be who we were meant to be. And I think that, you know, blessedly, if I had, you know, as a young boy growing up in Jersey City in Carteret, New Jersey, you know, would have thought that there was an African-American president or that there were gay candidates or whomever. It's just like whoever our background is, whatever our ethnicity, whatever our race, whatever our gender or, or sexual orientation is that people should have the ability to excel on the merits. And I think that's uh, uniquely an, an American American narrative. Let me ask you this. Um, 2016 now, so we're at a different, uh, more mature state in this country. But in, 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 in retrospect, or even at any time, did you think that um, you should have stayed or you could have stayed? I know it's interesting in Greenwich here, we have a selectman, board of selectmen approach, uh, to our leadership, and uh, one of the members is gay, and I didn't even know about it. It's a complete, yeah. complete non-issue here. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Jim, I was down at the University of Pennsylvania some time ago talking to students, and there was a LGBT students, and it was almost like talking to the young Republicans or the young Democrats or, you know, or whatever ethnic organization. We were talking about education and transportation infrastructure and incentives for green energy and the economy and uh, high technology. And, and, and it's almost as if, you know, the issue was a distant sidebar. And I thought to myself laughingly on the way home, my God, how far we've traveled as a country. Would you, would you, have, would you have stayed on in this environment or you just think the scandal nature would have forced you out either way? Well, you know, it's just it, it's hard to yeah, it's look right. at things retrospectively and say what if. So, I mean, it was uh, as you know we say in, in the rooms in AA on God's time, and and it was I think the appropriate decision at the time. I think not only for my sake and the sake of my family, but 
perhaps as importantly or even more importantly for the sake of the state, you know, people just need to, to move on to do the serious business of administering a state and grappling with those, you know, sort of day-to-day and long-term challenges. So I think it was the right decision. In, uh, in, in reading your book, it just really comes across of what a swamp New Jersey is or what was then, and I don't know if it still is, of, 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 of compromise, pay-to-play, corruption. Um, well, I, you know, I, Jimmy, I don't know whether New Jersey is, is markedly different from any other <laughs> place in, in America. And I love New Jersey. I'm New, New Jersey bullish. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my grandparents came from Ireland to Jersey City, and now um, I work at the pleasure working, you know, five blocks from where I was baptized and where my parents were married. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, you know, I mean, New Jersey perhaps has more colorful figures. You think of Louisiana, you think of Illinois. New York. The, the democratic <laughs> process for all of its flaws and faults and all of its strengths is remarkably the same. And it, it's just it's a series of compromise and and sort of human beings, God willing, will do the right thing for the right reasons, but all too frequently people get tempted, um, particularly on the money side. But that's why, you know, you're blessed with an attorney general's office and a U.S. attorney's office, um, hopefully to make sure that people do what's right. Did uh, You were a young change agent, obviously. Was it... Uh... Was your value system were you were you internally stressed all the time because of all the compromises you had to make, and and talk a little bit about about what you describe as sort of the ego needs that 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 sort of were almost addictive uh, for the for the power. Well, you know that is so true. I mean the the narcissism in politics today. I mean with its you know, the Republican National Convention or I assume to a degree in the Democratic National Convention. I mean, as somebody once joked that, um, you know, politics is show business for ugly people, <laughs> that the, you know, the sort of the drive, the narcissistic drive is there. And it's difficult, right? Because this is a very different generation. This is a very different era and sort of in the instant communication. But you think of, you know, you go back in time to the letters between, you know, Adams and, and Jefferson and the fact it took three or four days to travel a letter and a letter was composed. And today things are instantly tweeted in physical appearance. And it, it's just it's just become so much more of the persona as opposed to the character. And mm. I, I, I do believe, I mean, I'm sounding more like my father, but I do believe it has a, a corrosive impact uh, on the value structure, on the purpose, on the intentionality of the political process. Interesting, because uh, Trump has to be the biggest narcissist maybe in political history. <laughs> Well, I'm out of politics now, so I, I, I won't comment. You're not going to touch. You're not going to touch. I'm not going to get you to touch that. One. Well, I mean, you just like you know, it, it's it's. Um, but believe me, but I I don't think narcissism is, is limited to any one yes. person uh, on that, on any side of the aisle, and so it's just. And and, and let me just talk about myself. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that need for a claim. I mean, perhaps it was wrapped up in, in my sexual orientation and my denial. But be that as it may, even in separate and apart. I mean, there's still that need. And then it's also the need for self-survival, the need to get reelected, and, mm-hmm. and everything that means, particularly in terms of money, in terms of influence, in terms of power. Um, is so could, that becomes a primary driving force. You talk about one of the things you're most uh, proud of was uh, ending pay-to-play in New Jersey is really one of your last acts when you had no uh, yeah, political I mean, worries. That was, it was, has, has that been successful? Here we are 12 yeah, years been, later. Yeah, it's been it's been significantly successful, sort of ending sort of the sort of the internizing world of, of of corrosive money and, and and politics. But you know, it's just you know, money always finds its way into the political process, which is so disconcerting. I mean, like every generation does their does the reform, but inevitably, I mean, today on the national level, it's super PACs, so that you know that people are donating to super PACs who would not otherwise donate or aren't donating in a, in, a, in a fund that's open, that's transparent, and readily visible by the public. So, yes, I sort of ended that pay-to-play, but now money's getting into the super PACs, and the super PACs are yeah. largely anonymous. They're not transparent, and people can write out a check for tons of money. And so I think the Supreme Court, frankly, did not do the American Democratic experience much good and enabling, you know, the wealthiest few to write unlimited amounts of money, 
which clearly Jim has a corrosive impact. I mean, you know, I, I well recognize that wealthy people, the wealthiest few, may have divergent interests, but clearly um, it has a corrosive impact because the public official, the elected official, is all too much in ten, all too much attenuated and to uh, those that are writing the greatest checks for the greatest amount of money. And so that has a deleterious impact on, on the democracy, on, on the legislative process, on the executive branch. Um, just 20 seconds, do you miss the power? No, I'm in a different place, Jim. I mean, I, I love what I do. I work in prison ministry. I work with people that are, you know, whether it's murder, whether it's drug addiction, whether it's distribution, whether it's salt. You know, people who frankly came from a very started, the, as I say, the race of life from a markedly different place than I did, but who want the same thing. I mean, when I was in seminary, I went up to Exodus Transitional Ministry and the dean, the priest who ran the seminary, said, I want you to go up there and work with these folks. You know, I'm sitting there shoulder to shoulder every day with people that spent 18, 20, 25 years. And Jim, they want the same thing that I, I did. They wanted a, a place to put their head on a pillow at night. They wanted some food in their stomach. They wanted a better life for their children. And they wanted the dignity of work. And so I love what I do now. And I'd, hopefully we can talk about that a little bit more. Yes. The Business Talk with Jim Campbell over the Business Talk Radio Network, 350 stations around the country. And with apologies to HBO, we are going to talk about the fall to grace next segment. We're talking with the former New Jersey governor, James McGreevy. Redemption in this uh, segment. Um, I've always wanted to say this word because I've never known how to uh, to pronounce it. But from drum thacket to Denny's. Um, you talk about Trump, <laughs> Trump, Trump Thackett being, of course, the governor's mansion there. The sheer steepness of that fall is unbelievable. Talk a little bit uh, about that recovery process you went out to the meadows. It's, 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 a, it's a pretty steep fall. Not something that I would uh, I would recommend for anyone. Um, <laughs> no, but it's just, uh, you, know, you know, Jim, you have all the nonsense, the helicopters, the cars, <laughs> less with. You know, I was blessed with the state police, and New Jersey State Police, I think, is the finest, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the, the finest state policing unit in the country. And, then you know, you, ha- you have all you know, the fundraisers in the whirlwind, and then all of a sudden, nothing. And that blessed peace, and then you grapple with what that peace means. And so a dear friend of mine said to me, you know, that, you know, as my grandmother would say, God works in mysterious ways. If you could do anything with your life, what would it be? And so I'd always wanted to go to seminary. In fact, when I was a young man, I thought about becoming a Jesuit priest, and I had actually enrolled, and at the last second decided not to. And so I went to seminary for three years, and it was transformational. I mean, not only in terms of the value structure, but the rituals of the daily Mass, getting up and understanding that life isn't about self, it's about service, um, being grateful for the gifts, of this day, the sun, earth, breath, etc., and realizing that the world isn't whipping around me. Um, and, and, and it's gradual, right? It, it doesn't happen overnight, but it sort of like seeps into your bones gradually. And so that transformation was so healthy, not only spiritually, but psychologically. And just and going to seminary every single day and and, you know, reading the Hebrew Bible, I mean, reading the Quran, reading the Christian Bible, the great thinkers from, you know, from, from Augustine to Chardin. And so that was, a, it was an interesting process of Imamides. And I sort of, I read everything, the Bhagavad Gita, I read everything I could get my hands on. And so part of it is, you know, it's just, I, I read this fellow um, in, in the psychology, psychology of religion class called Joseph Campbell. And I don't know if you ever read Campbell, but The Power of Myth, um, The Hero. And Campbell posits that we're all the hero. Each and every one of us in our lives is a hero. We're born, we travel from that birth canal, we're exposed to the world, we begin to grow up as toddlers, as young children, we eventually go off from school, leave home. And, And Campbell has a great phrase, where you trip, that's where your treasure lies. And so Campbell's whole point is, is that you have to be open to the experiences of life, draw wisdom from that, but then give it back. And so the dean of the seminary, a great fellow, uh, Father Ward Ewing, told me to uh, go up to Exodus Transitional Ministry in Harlem 
And here I was working with people who had been in Sing Sing and state prison and federal prison, largely state prisons for 15, 20 years. And, and, and Jim, I mean, the, the, you know, women that were sexually abused, victims of domestic violence, you know, young men that had grown up in horrific circumstances that joined gangs that, that joined gangs to survive. Um, that's the that's the uh, Jersey City ferry you hear in the background. Mm-hmm. But I mean, the, the the point is is that you know these people want it, and so in, the sad thing in America is we're five percent of the world's population, but we're twenty five percent of the world's incarcerated population. We lock up more people in America than any country in the world. And the second is Russia, and so the sad thing is today we have more African American males locked up. Then South Africa had black South Africans at the height of apartheid Jeez. as a percentage of the population. And so if you were to go back, if, if Jim, if you and I were to kick back and to say, if I wanted to correct somebody's behavior, how would I do it? Well, what you would do is you would put people into healthy places, you know, godly places, places that reflected the good values. And what we do in America is we put people in the most maladaptive, level in places, namely state penitentiaries. And so what happens in state penitentiaries all across America, and 70% of the people behind bars are addicts, is that you have access to drugs, you have violence, you have you know, sexual violence. And the crazy thing is, is between wardens and gangs and, and the confluence of, of drugs, you have some of the, the most disturbed places. And so you take a 17 or 19 year old who's been convicted of CDS distribution, which is a serious charge, and you put them in prison for three years. You're you're damning them to learning worse behaviors, to replicating, if you will, the worst traits in human beings. I mean, you, you want to destroy trust, honesty, integrity. There's not a better way to do it. And so our system, our prison system, you know, I, as a construct, is inherently flawed. And it's got a, and it's got a two-thirds failure rate. I mean, 67 68%, you look at the national indicators, people are back within three years, or people commit a felony with three years. You know, so uh, if, uh, I was going to say, the, the uh, documentary really, really shows um, your personal connection uh, with these folks, and you can almost feel their self-esteem I- uh, growing uh, right in, in uh, front of you. Have you found that the folks you've worked with have stayed out so that you can actually oh. demonstrate that this works like Norway or wherever else it's much more rehabilitative? Yeah. I mean, Jim, our recidivism rate is 19.2%. There you go. I mean, you compare that to the national average, and our numbers are documented by the United States Department of Health, Department of Justice, the Second Chance Program, and DOJ does a great job. I mean, they provide needed monies. Uh, George Bush, 43, President Obama, I mean, provided monies for the Second Chance Program. It can be done, but you have to provide structured sober housing. You have to continue to provide addiction treatment. If somebody's an addict and they haven't received any treatment and they walk out that door, they're going to go back to the corner to run and gun and dope. And so you need treatment. You need structured sober housing. You need training programs that enable people to have a job as well as, you know, identification and linking people to health care. And it's, and it's gritty, and you have to roll up your sleeves, Jim, but it's so much less expensive than the cost of a cell, than the cost of incarceration. And more to the point is, people transform their lives. People become self-sufficient taxpayers, as opposed to those sort of locked up in the, in the endless cycle of, of violence and addiction that does harm to the community, as well as harm to the individual. What, what's it feel like to go from, uh, you know, a young guy trying to change the world, maybe even on a path to the presidency, to, to helping individuals one at a time? Well, it's, in many ways, it's so much more fulfilling mm-hmm. because, I mean, it's not sort of the grandiose story. I mean, you know, what makes the, the diary of Anne Frank so powerful, whether it's, it's the book or the play, it's about a family that you can relate to. Um, I remember a brother in high school said that, um, you know, that sort of the stories, it was, you know, the stories of whether it's, it's Harriet Tubman or the individual stories is, is, is what moved people, um, 
instead of, you know, so you try to understand large calamities in the history of the world, um, whether it's the Holocaust or American slavery, and it almost becomes, or, you know, you know, terrors around the world today, and it almost becomes unimaginable because the sale and the scale and the size is too much. But when you understand these are, these are human beings and these are families and these are mothers and these are children, that, that brutal picture of that young child washing up on the beach in Europe, I mean, captured people's horror and soul. I mean, we all talked about the immigrant crisis, but seeing that young boy, life, lifeless body on the beach, so it, it's, it, it, it resonates to me, and frankly, it keeps me honest. It keeps me doing what it is that I'm meant to do. The, um, President Nixon uh, said when he was resigning, uh, only when you're in the deepest valley can you understand the mountaintop. Did, does your, um, the steepness of yours, do you relate to that? Yeah, but my mountaintop has changed. Yeah. So that's, I mean, yes, I mean, I, I think sort of, sort of, you know, when when we're at our nadir, um, you know, we have the opportunity, there's less distraction between what, how I understand myself and my theology or my God or my higher power, because, you know, you don't have all the distractions of American capitalism. And, you know, to such a degree, you know, capitalism today or consumerism has become our God. I mean, that's our general ordering principle or direction, if you will. But, 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 but there was a value shift. There was a priority shift, if you will. There was a mountain shift with me in seminary. I mean, talking about a, a meaningful life that hopefully a life based on gratitude, a life based on service. I mean, to, you know, that great phrase by um, Winston Churchill, we make a, a living by what we get, we make a life by what we give. And, 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 and it's, 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 giving back, and that's where the meaning is. And the problem is, in narcissism, it's never fulfilled. I mean, you just keep going. And somebody described it as blowing up the balloon. Good Every point. time the balloon has to, has to be blown up further and further and further and stretched further and further, because you have this ugly need to satiate that psychology. But in service, it's, it's not about the self. It's about the other. And so it's the paradigm shifts. Fascinating. And it's um, also about humility. And humility is an important piece of this, Jim. You see, it's, the ability to understand our place in the world, our place in the universe, our place in creation. Is it like breaking an addiction almost to go from narcissism to humility? Well, I think it's what I would call it. I would call it a healthy spirituality. Mm-hmm. I mean, instead of, you know, and, and we're all on that journey. Um, well, I know I am, but and I think many of us are on that journey to find a healthy set of values. And, and it's tough because today, I mean, we've become unmoored from those traditional values. And in that sense, obviously, in terms of LGBTQ rights, that I mean, that's a very good, healthy development. But there's also, I mean, there's also something crass about today's values in terms of the commercialism and, and, and the need for, as I would argue, the need for service, the need to service to the nation, to the community, to family, to other. As we get down here to the end, um, it's very inspirational. You really do believe in second acts, and you can uh, literally begin your life anew? Yeah, like, you know, second acts, third acts. I mean, what <laughs> you just said, you know, don't forgive seven times, 70 times seven. So, I mean, it's just, and it's whatever, you know, whatever spiritual tradition or, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a theology or have to be God-centered, but sort of finding, as Lincoln said, you know, our better angels. And that, to me, is however we do that. And for me, it's, it's gratitude, it's service, and at the end of the day, it's love. And it's, and it's, you know, to have a healthy love of self is to be in the service of, of other human beings. And I think that's the challenge. Not to do what my ego, my will would have me do, but as I understand my higher power, to do what it is that God would have me do, which for my life is, is prison ministry and helping people have a second chance who I would argue never even had a first chance. One more thing that was a great, uh, a great ending there. Um, you talk, you talk about developing your authentic self. I thought it was very interesting that integration and integrity you put is from the same roots. Yes, I mean they're from from the same Latin root, and so to understand that core and to understand to have healthy authenticity, and you know, sort of when your thoughts, your actions, and your heart are in alignment, and, and there's that great quote from the Hebrew Bible. And so it's understanding at the end of the day that's what's going to enable to do enable you to do your best work, your best service, is when you are fully integrated, you are healthily integrated, 
so that your own sense of personal integrity is manifested in your thoughts, in your heart, and in your actions. We've been talking with Jim McGreevy, the former governor of New Jersey, and a great story of redemption and the service now that uh, emanates from his heart every single day. Thank you, Governor. Uh, really appreciate your time. Jim, thank you so much for your time. A poster child for the Enron, Worldcom, Tyco era of corporate greed and fraud, or the victim of prosecutors run amok. The infamous $6,000 shower curtain, the $2 million birthday party with the ice statue of Michelangelo urinating vodka, the tragic fall of Tyco CEO Dennis Kozlowski, was it prosecutorial abuse that led to the railroading of a legendary CEO? In his only broadcast interview since release from prison, setting history straight, a Biz Talk exclusive today on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Dennis Kozlowski was a 27-year veteran of Tyco, the last 10 years serving as CEO, building one of the most successful growth machines in the history of corporate America, thousands of acquisitions until the downfall and a prison sentence of unprecedented length serving more time than murderers. This interview is based in part on a book by Northern Kentucky University's College of Business Ethics professor Catherine Neal, the book Taking Down the Lion, the Triumphant Rise and Tragic Fall of Tycho's Dennis Kozlowski. We're honored to have you. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Jim. Nice to be here this morning. Okay. Um, it's good to put this, this whole experience in perspective because the whole corporate lynching era from then, is, is, we're, we're beyond that. Um, again, uh, an incredible record. You started at $20 million in revenues, built it to $40 billion. 40 quarters of increased profits, and that's 10 years, and you serve 10 years. So that's pretty consistent record. And yet the legacy obscure, obscured by the shower curtain and other things. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, I feel good about my 27 years at Tyco and the record we put together uh, for our for our shareholders and the, and the amount of growth we had there during that time. Uh, and I feel that I put the era of... Uh, my prosecution and uh, what I went through in back of me now. Uh, you know, that's, uh, th- that was some time ago. And I'm off to a, to a new start, uh, doing other things and moving on from, you know, from where I was. So I'm, I'm into the next chapter of my life and well into it. Okay, we're going to get to that. Um, let's talk about those two things quickly that obscured the legacy and, and, and the myth around them. The $6,000 shower curtain, explain it a little bit. You never even saw it. No, I never, I never saw that. I, uh, that, that was, uh, a decorator who installed a shower curtain from what I understood. And I only got to understand that at the time that, you know, I was indicted you know, by the Manhattan DA. Uh, so, so never saw it. No, wouldn't know it if it fell on me. Now that place was 18 million bucks plus 10 million of, uh, renovations for which you were planning to use for a couple of days a month, right? Why? Why, well, would, you, why we, would you need that? Well, uh, Jim, you know, you, we're going back to something a very long time ago. And uh, as I said, I really moved on from, from that era of my life. But we were doing a lot of deals in New York at the time, and we couldn't be seen in public. The Internet was starting. If other CEOs or people uh, who had investment uh uh, opportunities were coming in to visit me, you'd be reading about it uh, on the internet. Uh, that was affecting our, uh, stock prices, and that was affecting our ability to do deals. So we wanted a place where we could hide away, uh, that it was Manhattan real estate, it was going to appreciate, uh, that uh, uh, that ultimately really wouldn't cost us anything through appreciation. And we, we did a number of deals uh, in that apartment. Uh, so it was really it's more than paid for the apartment. Yeah, it was it was really a a a, a corporate you know, headquarter of of sorts where we did it. And I think at the end of the day, uh, after I left Tyco, uh, the apartment was sold for more money than than was into it. And I, I will say that uh, the first problem arose because of the paintings that were installed. Uh, sales tax wasn't paid, and you were kind of held accountable for that. But normally, the seller is not the buyer, so it seemed to be almost a superfluous, un, you know, unfair attack. On sure. That. Well, and, and and those charges were later dismissed you know, against me. Exactly. So. Um, uh, on the birthday party, uh, the only question there is the, it's sort of blurring of personal and corporate. You actually paid for all the personal. That's part, correct. But you know, again, I, in, in in retrospect, a you didn't know that it was going to be that sort of off the wall, right? The theme and all that. Well, yeah, the the thing. Well, it, the the DA managed to yeah. put a couple of segments from, you know, from a get together 
and 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 play it up. There were children at the party. There were directors of mine at the party. Uh, it was no big deal. It was a, a couple hour event in in, in the middle of you know, other things going on, and all expenses associated with that were personally paid for by me. Okay, um, let's. Uh, the, the you were accused of basically stealing one hundred and seventy million dollars from Tyco through undocumented secret loans, et cetera. Um, the sentence ended up uh, hundred. You were in uh, prison, I think, for over a hundred months. The average homicide is fifty-two months. They tried to charge you under a RICO, which is you know criminal enterprise mafia, and they I guess all eighty of those charges were were uh, shut out. You were tried by the state, not the federal. Uh, all this was documented though by Price Waterhouse and your board. Well, the uh, the, the, the uh, bonuses were all on the books and records of the company. Yes. Yes, and and the bonuses were all audited you know, by, you know, by outside auditors. Um, you know, so all all that was there. Uh, my, uh, I was accused uh, and convicted of uh, not having the bonuses appropriately approved uh, by directors. So which so, is why they call yeah. it stealing your own bonuses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, your assets were frozen for 11 years? They were, yes. Uh, that's one of the things I think most people don't know, uh, it, that the DA has enormous amounts of power. Uh, they can freeze your assets and make it extremely difficult for you to function uh, at, when you are indicted. And so uh, your ability to hire legal counsel, to pay your bills, uh, to function as, you know, as a normal person is rapidly taken away well before you're convicted. Uh, so you're not convicted of anything at that time, and yet uh, your assets are suddenly frozen. Checks you wrote to the electric company and uh, to uh, to the fuel company, to whoever, uh, begin to bounce as, as soon as they freeze your assets. And uh, this is done well before anybody's convicted, before you show up in court, be, you know, before you do anything. So there's an awful lot of prosecutorial power uh, you know, that really handicaps somebody and their ability to defend themselves. When you're supposed to be presumed innocent at that time. Um, looking back, do you, do you feel that you were railroaded? Do you feel remorseful? Uh, Jim, I, I, think, I, I think this whole incident is best told by a third party. Uh, and that third party in this case uh, is uh, Professor Neal, Professor Catherine Neal from Northern Kentucky University, who I did not know uh, before all this uh, happened, uh, who was teaching ethics courses at her university. Uh, she was trying to figure out what went on at uh, Tycho. Uh, she, you know, she took a sabbatical to research it. Uh, she interviewed the DA. She interviewed jurors. She interviewed employees of the company. And she came to her own conclusions. And her conclusions were, uh, which I agree with, her conclusions were, uh, nothing criminal, you know, went on. Sure, there was some some bad judgment, but this was the '90s too. Yeah. You know that we were talking about. You know, growth our growth was spectacular, uh, and 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 there was some there was some bad judgment, but but uh, uh, Professor Neal, I think, really came to the right conclusions, and, and uh, it's well documented in her book. Uh, very well documented. And also, I asked her point blank. Uh, she said that uh, you uh, told her to pursue the truth 100% wherever it led. Yes, I had no influence yeah, whatsoever no influence. wherever she was going. All right, let's talk about some of the factors now in our remaining couple of minutes. Timing. Um, you were long done with Enron and all that, but those companies all went belly up. That's and correct. Tyco was a profitable, uh, hugely successful entity at the same time. So bad luck, or Tyco? Tyco thrived to this day. Uh, you know, I, I, I have not been able to track, you know, what, uh, you know, what others have done with Tyco well after I left it, but it was wildly successful and continues to be wildly, you know, successful today. It, it's broken up into a number of other companies, uh, but it's it's done extremely well. Now, what about sometimes, you know, success is, and downfall can be the same traits, right? Uh, you, you, ha you were very uh, successful motivating your folks by a decentralized philosophy, by um, profit incentives, et cetera. But you weren't in touch with a lot of the stuff. A lot of the things we just talked about, right, you didn't really know were going on, the curtain and all that stuff. So was it kind of, you know, some of your downfall brought about by the qualities made you successful? Sure. We, we had a very small corporate staff. We we believed in uh, finding the best people we can around the world to uh, run our businesses and keeping our corporate staff very small and, and non-bureaucratic. Uh, so we had 260,000 people worldwide 
uh, running businesses in over 60 different countries, uh, there's no way one person's going to have a handle uh, with, with that kind of growth. Uh, you really have to, uh, you really have to delegate and uh, really have to uh, decentralize and find entrepreneurial types, you know, to run the businesses. So, so you know, a lot of the uh, details were you know, were you know were not known by people back you know back at headquarters. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell over the Business Talk Radio Network. Over 300 stations around the country. You can go to biztalkradio.com and find the nearest station to you to listen over the internet, access our archives of podcast. Coming next, the rise of Dennis Kozlowski. Back with Dennis Kozlowski, the deposed lion of Tycho. Um, y- you went to what you call a gated community in a mid-state uh, correctional facility, and you became the laundry czar. I did. Tell I, us uh, about prison. And, uh, uh, the, the laundry job I quickly recognized was probably the best job in prison. It kept me out of my cell. So you're always a good about, business guy. <laughs> about <laughs> nine hours a day. <laughs> yeah, It paid 85 cents a day. Uh, so it, it was probably one of the higher paying jobs there. Uh, and, but I was able to... Uh, do laundry, uh, pick up, deliver laundry, and read books uh, you know, within the laundry room while the washing machines and dryers were doing their work. So uh, uh, I raised my hand for that job and you know, ultimately you know, wound up doing it. How did you survive over 100 months when you saw kidnappers, rapists, murders uh, going in and out? Not reading. Uh, I, I, I did it through two things. I, I, I read every biography, fiction, nonfiction book I could get my hands on or sent into me. And uh, I had wonderful support from uh, from family, from friends. And, um, and, Dennis' uh, from, wife, from, Kimberly, is sitting right from here. from Kimberly, yes. And by the way, she's very supportive. You can't see she's nodding on, uh, all, all <laughs> throughout, the, uh, throughout this. Um, now, I mean, uh, we're laughing a little bit about that, but what were the worst moments? I, I think the worst moments were the holidays, uh, you know, having um, Thanksgivings and Christmas and uh, you know, th- th- that time uh, in jail. Uh, uh, th- the worst moments were when my uh, daughters got married. Uh, my grandchildren were born. You know, not being there for, you know, for for uh, for those events. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, things things that center around uh, family times. Or uh, m- uh, my daughter suffered a significant injury while traveling in Bali, uh, a life threatening injury, and. Uh, I wasn't able to uh, reach out or contact her. I was communicating through Kimberly, you know, uh, to my to my daughter. Uh, so, you know, there there's some pretty horrific moments, you know, now while, you, while there. You gave a building to Seton Hall where you went, and they took your name off of it. Um, how does that hurt? Well, no, I asked them to take my name you off did. of Jim. Yeah, yeah. But you didn't yeah. ask for your money back, probably. No, I didn't. You know, but but I, I you know, I think. Yeah, you know, why why stir up controversy or okay. why put the administration in a position that they you know have something that they you know, uh, would have a tough time defending? How uh, did your health hold up through all this? Uh, my health was generally pretty good. Uh, uh, I did have one incident uh, where uh, uh, you know, I, I had a, a heart issue, but you no, know, I came out of it fine. Uh, yeah, but it's it's no place to be if you're sick or. No, no or, or or have a health issue. Uh, Probably not a very healthy meal. Uh. <laughs> no, no, the, the, the food is horrible. Now, on, on the finance <laughs> side, you paid. Uh, we we talked. Your assets were frozen for eleven years. You paid one hundred and sixty-seven million dollars in fines. How did you survive financially? Uh, I, you know, I, I I had to sell off my assets and and pay the fines and uh, uh, pay the restitution. Uh, that was that was you no. Know, so I, I sold my homes. I you know, sold what I had and and uh, you know, satisfied all the debts. And you're making money now. I'm I'm back working now. Yes, I'm I'm doing uh, merger and acquisition work, uh, some business consulting work. I have some wonderful clients, and uh, uh, I'm I'm back in the swing of things. So you're not going to go buy a bunch of companies. No, no, not not personally. No, no. Tyco Junior. Yeah, yeah, no. 
Do you do you have a? Let's talk a little bit about reform items, uh, prism, and then governance. Do you uh, you sat in there? Do you have uh, um, ideas for uh, uh, prison reform, or there's a lot of waste going on, right? Of talent and folks go back out on the street with nothing. Yeah, uh, well, prison reform is uh, should be high on everybody's agenda because it's such a drain on society. Yeah. Now, it, uh, I'm I'm involved in the uh, Fortune organization, uh, which helps people coming out of. Uh, out of jail uh, to get back on their feet, um, providing housing, uh, job training, and ultimately jobs, and 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 that's really what you know, needs to be done. Uh, people need a place to live uh, as they're going through a transition until they can become taxpayers themselves. Uh, and 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 we do a lot of that at Fortune. We helped I think seven or eight thousand people last year alone. Now you were obviously successful as a laundry czar and all you did. You were turned down for parole though the first time. I was, yes. I was turned down for work release. Uh, what was you know. that based on? Uh, I, I, I certainly met all the requirements. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, on corporate governance, do you have ideas there? And um, uh, You actually were innovative in, in, in appointing a lead director long before that was popular. Do you think yes. the chairman and CEO uh, role should be split? How, how would you define independence? Sure. I, I, I do not think the chairman and CEO role should be split. I, I believe yeah. that... No, uh, any time I've seen that role split, no, I, I've seen dysfunction at the top. Uh, Hewlett Packard. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good example. <laughs> the best example. Yeah, a good example. But, but I do like the idea of lead director, where directors can, uh, you know, put things on an agenda through somebody other than the CEO. Now, um, it's clearly you did nothing of, of a criminal nature, as as we've been talking about. And the company was highly successful. The stock price was successful until you hit to the two, the uh, two thousand and one crisis, nine eleven, and internet financial crisis of oh eight. Criminal behavior everywhere, if you ask me. Uh, selling fraudulent, uh, you know, CD crap junk, right? Which they knew was going in there. No one has gone to jail for oh yes. eight. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that says it all, right? I mean. Uh, you know, it, you know, it was a different time in 2001, 2002, uh, after uh, Enron and WorldCom. Uh, and then you get to 2008, uh, and, and it's even worse than that because companies were borrowing mo- uh, failed companies were borrowing mo- money from the government to pay big bonuses to people who made the decisions that failed the companies. Uh, that's what really yeah. blows my well, mind. A, a no. lot of, where a lot of Americans lost 40% of their 401ks. So. That's correct. Yes. Now, um, you were a workaholic. Um, what what in where, where you are now? What are the lessons you feel you learned, and, and who are you now? Yeah, well, how the, do you change? Yeah, the the, the growth that uh, we pushed at the time uh, was unnecessary. We could have grown the company at you know, thirty or forty percent of the rate that we were growing it at, and had a wildly successful company and a lifestyle. I had no balance back then. Uh, my whole life was all about the company, and uh, you know I you know that that, that was a that was a huge mistake and a, and a big lesson learned. Uh, and I, I think uh, any enterprise to be successful you know, needs the right amount of balance. You know, you can't have a CEO who's just pushing it you know, all of the time and expecting everybody around him to be, you know, to be pushing at the same rate. Uh, so uh, I, I think that was you know, my biggest takeaway here. I, you know, I pushed too hard, too fast, too long. All right. Uh, thanks to Dennis Kozlowski. That was a hugely fast hour and really appreciate him coming by because he's keeping a low profile. He's not doing interviews. So it really means a lot that you've uh, done this and uh, to see you doing so well after being railroaded for so long is a good thing, obviously. Uh, thanks to Catherine Neal again for the, the book, Taking Down the Lion, the Triumphant Rise and the Tragic Fall of Tycho's Dennis Kozlowski. And if you read it in detail, you're going to have a hard time wondering what the heck he was charged with. This has been Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Stay with us as we go into overtime now. Thanks to Dennis Koslowski. Thanks to our national audience for listening, and we'll see you next Sunday on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell. This is Segment 5 Overtime exclusively for Yale Radio, and thanks to Dennis Koslowski for agreeing to stay with us for a few minutes. And now we're really honored. His wife, Kimberly, has been in the studio and uh, obviously been a huge reason why Dennis has come out of this so well, and uh, she's agreed to, to tell us a little bit. Uh, tell us the story of, of, of how you met and and what spurred you to communicate with him in prison that basically changed his life. 
I was a former trader on Wall Street, and uh, I was trading Tyco stock, and that's when I had initially met Dennis. But uh, CEOs don't pay too much attention to traders that they've met. And um, uh, I was going through a difficult time in my own life. I have some wonderful friends that had a home upstate and offered to uh, have me go up there just for a little retreat. I had been following Dennis's story and what was going on. I knew at that time he was somewhere upstate. Just something made me reach out. And uh, I wrote him a letter and asked him, I don't know if you remember me. Of course he said he did. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to be upstate. Do you mind if I uh, come up and pay a visit? He said, not at all. So you, so you didn't really know him. And it was just, a, you were, a, were you a trader or an analyst? Trader. You were a trader. And uh, so it was like an act of God or something, just good luck or? Did you feel his pain or something, or? Well, how could you not? It, did you think he? Did you, you obviously that's only had access to all this public stuff, and he's convicted. Did you assume that he was guilty of all this stuff? Or? No, I knew I knew he wasn't. You knew he the wasn't the person that Dennis was. I know it was just a railroad job. It was just such a public spectacle in the papers, and it just wasn't the person that I knew or knew of. I should say. I've heard that a great deal of integrity and great with people and everything. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in the press, uh, you were basically a monster, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, so it's um, so so. Go ahead. So that, so now you actually go uh, visit him in prison. How what evolves? Um, well, I went up. Uh, prison was something very new, so it was a little intimidating. But I went up there as soon as I got in. Dennis was doing what he does best: makes everybody feel extremely comfortable, very welcoming. And uh, I was only going to stay for two hours, and before I knew it, I was there for six and a half hours. Is that right? And are you uh, how, what, are you like behind, how does it work? Are you allowed to be in a room with him? Are you, are you behind glass or something? Or no, no, no. It's nothing like it's on television. Okay, and there's no it's time limit. Is there no time limit? Obviously, if you could stay six hours. Uh, not a time. They do have visiting hours from eight till three o'clock, and uh, everybody has to leave at that time. Can you have a, a private conversation, or are you just in a room? No. We are in an open room, but yeah. we're at a private table. You're a just table. Just the two of us. Yes. It's a, it's like a cafeteria. Uh, it's a square tables, for micro tables, and there's there's guards around you know, watching every move, and uh, there's a lot of rules. Uh, but you know, you sit there and and, and talk as if you were in your and you were, cafeteria. You were surprised by the chemistry, or uh, I would assume. Or? Well, yeah, it, the chemistry built over time. Had you did you yeah. remember her, by the way? Uh, I, I did. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm not going to say no. Right, sitting right <laughs> here. <right now. laughs> so you're not even capable of lying. <laughs> um. So how did it evolve? It, it, it was a wonderful bond. It and was how a wonderful you, bond. I was able to, at that time, reach out and help somebody uh, that I, that was, I don't want to say in need, but. He was in his situation. I was in my situation. For me, it was a good distraction from what I was going through. And I felt like I could bring something to the table for Dennis. And over time, we just sat and we talked. And you really get to know each somebody when you sit at a table with them for six, seven hours with no outside stimulation whatsoever. We weren't dating. We weren't going out to yeah, dinner. That was going to be my next question. You talk about your character. He's in prison for 100 months. I don't know which month you started knowing him, but obviously you had to wait until he got out to have any kind of a dating kind of relationship. Yeah, Kim, Kim was uh, later in the process. I was probably around the 70th month or so. You know, so I, she only I, had to wait three years. Yeah, 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 so she only had to wait three years. Was that tough? Or? <laughs> it was, well, there was constant communication, and that's what our relationship was based on. So we were able to have letters, phone calls, see each other on the Emailing weekends. and stuff like that? Not no, email. no emails. No emails. Oh, see, I get to email with, um, with yeah. Madoff. It's a, a prison has to approve it, and, and then they can read every one. Yeah. And um, I don't want to go into They arbitrarily no. stopped it, and I just went, kept back until I got the warden to, uh, to, to, to uh, you know, reverse it. So you couldn't even email? No. So you're writing letters? Long, yes. Long, beautiful, handwritten letters. Yep. Really? Yep. Yes. Which you kept? I have every one. So how long out, 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 out of uh, prison until you got married? It was uh, about three years out. Uh, see, we, we've been married two years. So, uh, yeah. yep. Is there anything else that you would say uh, about him that w the public wouldn't know? or 
And how do you think he's changed, too? I think that Dennis has finally found a real balance in his life. I think that working all of the time, he knows the importance of family, his daughters. He has two beautiful grandchildren. He's great with my children. And I think that uh, he comes home every night and we leave all the business stuff at the door. And I think that uh, when he comes home, he's very focused on me, I'm focused on him. And we just have built a wonderful, communicative life together. <laughs> we just always communicate. How did freedom feel like? Oh, it, it was wonderful. It was uh, freedom first came with uh, work release, and uh, which is somewhere in Manhattan. You stayed. Yeah, it was up on 110th Street in, in okay. Manhattan. And uh, when I was transported uh, uh, from Midstate uh, to uh, uh, Ulster, and uh, I, I was in something called. Uh, protective custody. So it's like being in a box. Uh, I, I, I had a very restrict uh, a whole lot of restrictions. I had to sit in the front row in the visiting room. Uh, I wasn't allowed outside. Uh, right. I wasn't allowed to use the mess hall or library or gymnasium. Uh, so it was it was it, it was a, its own form of punishment. So my time was harder than you know, than the average time because of who you were. You mean because or? of who I was? Yes. Were you were you in a cell by yourself? I, I, was, I, I was in the cell by myself, but but it was it it, it used to be a punishment cell, uh, it, it called the box, uh, uh, the thing that all the controversy is is about right now. How long somebody should be in, you know, in, in the box, and uh, so they couldn't break you. <laughs> no, I didn't break. <laughs> okay, back to Tycho for a sec. Um, did you see yourself? Uh, how would you, did you see yourself, uh, we talked about whether in GE and Berkshire and other places, what, what, what was there something you were modeling on, your, uh, on or um, was there a consistent vision you had, or was it we're going to just be as opportunistic as possible within our lines of business? Yeah, we, we were going to, the Warren Buffett model of Berkshire Hathaway was, you know, it was, I thought, the, the greatest model, you know, out okay, there. So you actually did yeah. buy into that. Yes, I totally bought into that. And, uh, you know, and, and Warren Buffett's role is if you're doing well and making your numbers, you don't have to call me. Don't even bother me uh, unless you want to call and, and say hello. Uh, if you're not doing well and not making you know, your plans and, and numbers, you know, then, then we need to talk. You know? And, and that, I really believe that. I, I believe you know, if you hire really good people, uh, they don't want you meddling you know, into their day-to-day. Uh, you know, they, they want to be able to run their business and and uh, communicate to the you know, to the extent that you no know, they need to communicate with but but no that that was that was the biggest role model I saw out there by the way uh, jack welch uh, got away with a lot of uh, earnings manipulation because he used to play with the reserves at ge capital when, you know yes. so um uh they couldn't do that today put it that way huh. um buffett obviously has a huge reputation for ethics integrity um did you push that kind of a culture down into tyco and, and I asked this in the concept of this, you can relate to GE too. Some people will criticize that all GE cares about is make your numbers, make your numbers, do whatever to make your numbers, um, and which can lead you to do dumb short-term things and maybe, you know, cross lines or whatever. Did you have a culture that, that wasn't so over the top, that bad behavior was inevitable kind of thing? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, uh, we certainly did not have an emphasis on integrity or ethics, uh, we, you know, we did what needed to be done by the law, uh, and uh, you know, our legal department, you know, had hotlines and all, all the things that you know were required at the time. Uh, but you know, we 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 did not spend you know uh, a lot of corporate resources or or you know dedicate you no know, de- uh, departments to that. Uh, that that was more a function of the post Enron and Sarbanes Oxley and. Uh, you know, where there was a great awakening by corporations. You think Sarbanes Oxley is a good thing, or too much of a? No, I, I, uh, I, I don't know much about it. I really don't. That was after my time, and you know, uh, so you're not going back to a public corporation. No, I? not no, no. Uh. Um, so at the height of your success versus where you are now, are you are you happier here now, even though there you had unbelievable power, money, and all that? Yeah, these are by far. The happiest days of my life. You know, there's no doubt about it. I have freedom, you know, which is yeah. some, 
you know, something that's been denied me for a lot of years. You know, even when I was on trial for the few years, you know, leading up, uh, I had, you know, really lost freedom for, you know, close to 12 years. Uh, so I have that. I appreciate it. Uh, I have a wonderful family. Uh, uh, and I have uh, friends. Uh, I'm, I'm working in business by you know, people who recognize me, you know, for what I've done in business, and are not defining me by you know the time that you know I, I, I went through, you know, the difficulties. You know, they're, they're defining me by you know what I was able to contribute to the business world. I'm doing some of that you know right now, and I'm, I'm real happy to have you know, moved on and putting that chapter in back of me and and enjoying my life right now with. Know, with with my family and uh, and with my wife and you know, you know with everybody that's involved in my circle. Now, as a fanatically goal driven person, at, at, at some time, what what kind of goals do you have now? Are you? Uh, my 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 focus right now is you no know, happiness. Seeing my grandchildren, uh, you know, find out as much about me on the good side as they possibly can. Uh, you know. Helping Kim figure out, you know, where her children are going to go to college. Yeah. Uh, and any, any ideas <laughs> on that? Yeah. We're pushing. No. <laughs> yeah. So, I went yeah. to Tufts and Dartmouth for business school, so I hope you're going to consider both of those. <laughs> yeah. And we should put Yale in there, right? <laughs> yeah. we're, we're talking yeah. about. Uh, we're, we're talking about that. Um, is there anything else that uh, that you would you, that you'd want to say? I, mean, I think we've uh, almost uh, covered everything. Uh, no, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, though, Jim, and I appreciate very nice you know, of you. Your, you know, your reading, uh, you know, I- into it and you know, going beyond the headlines and you know, getting an understanding of really what went on here. You know, I I, I appreciate that. No, you know, uh, very yeah. very much. I really wish the media would do the job that you know that that they should do. They don't do, they don't pursue the truth anymore, or they don't investigate, or they don't look b- below the surface. I think right now, for instance, in the presidential race, nobody's looking into Trump. That's right. You know, and he's That's kind right. of a dangerous guy. That's right. And yeah. why wouldn't the media be doing that? Yeah. Are they intimidated by him, or is no, it, is they're, it they're just, just running they, sound bites? They're what just he running said. sound bites. That's it. Um, he doesn't even he doesn't have to spend any money even because <laughs> right. he's you know he's, it's like a ten to one. Uh, yeah. Do you have any interest in politics? Not going into politics, but are you following the campaign? Are you? Oh, of um, course. You know, it's 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 very entertaining this year. <laughs> 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 Which is kind of sad, by the way, yeah. given that the country's falling apart. Yes. And. and uh, and everything. Well, it's good to see that, uh, God, I don't know how you would come through what you've come through and be such a optimistic and, you know, good guy and not have it destroy you. So it must be a testimony <laughs> to your character. Yeah, it's, it's better than any alternative. I'll tell you that. It's, it beats the alternative. <laughs> and uh, blessed that you came out of uh, the woodwork uh, the way you did and stayed with them and did all this stuff. It's really, it's a, it's a great story. And if you read the book, you can't come to any other conclusion. You know, because I went into it like I'm just totally. I don't. I'm going to be cynical. I'm going to assume he was guilty. You know, sure. the media. I mean, the uh, the prosecutors only go after guys that are guilty. And then you read this thing, and you can't find anything. Yeah. That is remotely um, criminal. Yeah, and and, and uh, Catherine, from what I understand, you know, double and trickle, tri- triple documented. You no, know, almost everything. And I think there's like a thousand footnotes in the book. So. By the way, I do want to uh, give her credit too because. Um, you know, why would someone want to take on this kind of a project when it would have been much easier to say, hey, look at all this, you know, to, yes. r- to write the, what was the general story. But um, so you believe good endings happen, right? I do. I do. Uh, do you believe that um, you can only um, uh, you can only re- appreciate the highest mountain if you've been in the lowest valley? I, I, I Not that do, you'd recommend yeah. going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I believe, you know, you, you don't need to go to the highest mountain. And, and stay away from the lowest valley, but you know, function someplace in between those two places. <laughs> okay. It's been a great honor having you here. Uh, obviously a legendary business record and, 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 uh, and a very honest, great human being who has survived uh, almost a lynching, you might say. And Kimberly, uh, great to meet you and to have you. And that you had the guts to kind of speak. I know you didn't really want to. I harassed you into it. Okay. Thanks to Dennis Kozlowski. This has been Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Thanks to our loyal Yale audience for staying with us. And we'll see you next Sunday on Business Talk with Jim Campbell.